That's cool. So That's after I read cool. it, I'll give it to you if you want to. Yeah, you know. put it in this file. Sure. <coughs> I'd like to call the meeting to order. Would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you. Can I have a roll call, please? Councilor Clemens? Present. Councilor Langevin? Present. Councilor Livingood? Present. Councilor Micucci? Present. Councilor McDonald? Present. Councilor Nicola? Present. Councilor Regis? Present. Councilor Spinelli? Present. Councilor Vandal? Present. Nine present? Thank you. Agenda item number three, consider and accept the council minutes of Monday, March 12th, um, 2012. Second. Councilor uh, McDonald? Thank you, Madam Chair. Page six, uh, fourth paragraph, uh, second sentence. Councilor McDonald stated if it is substandard, that should be, Councilor McDonald stated it should be standard that it would be more beneficial to those who are not in regular attendance at subcommittee meetings to have the meeting minutes there. And then in the last paragraph, second, uh, second Six. sentence, Six. should be acting Chief DeFranzo. What were, the, what were the two reference points? I didn't get it. Page six. Yeah. Fourth paragraph. Second sentence it says substandard. It should be standard. Okay. I'll cross that step. Gotcha. And then uh, last paragraph, second sentence, it says active Chief DeFranzo should be acting chief. Acting. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else have anything needs to be changed or corrected? Okay. Councilor Clements will be abstaining. All in favor of the minutes? Eight. Yes, one abstention. Thank you. Okay, agenda item number four, subcommittee reports, A, general government. Councilor Spinelli. Uh, Madam Chair, I have no minutes, but agenda items 9, 10, and 11, 12 were discussed at our last general government subcommittee meeting, and they all went forward with uh, affirmative recommendations. Thank you, Councilor. B, DPW, Councilor Vandal. Thank you. Um, C, Education Human Services, Councillor Clements. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we did have a meeting on March 22nd. I do not have the meeting minutes. However, um, a number of the items this evening on the agenda are in relation to that, so I'll just summarize a little bit. The first agenda item was discussing the capital project uh, that's involving Bay Path Vocational High School, which we'll hear more of later and also to approve the language that is necessary um, for this agenda item, and that was favorably recommended to council, along with the, um, uh, also agenda item two was the Bay Path High School budget, uh, which we did discover that our, um, what's the word? Our assessment, excuse me, um, has been lowered, is, has gone down this year, so that's good for, for the town. Um, agenda item three was a change order, a couple of change orders on the middle school, high school project. And agenda item four was the memorandum of agreement between the town of Southbridge Tri-Valley for use of the community center uh, for the Meals on Wheels program. And um, each of those items were favorably recommended to council. Thank you. Uh, no meeting scheduled at this time. Thank you, Councillor. D, Planning and Development, Councillor Livingood. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I have no report and no meeting schedule. Thank you. E, Protection of Persons and Property, Councillor Langevin. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have no report and no meeting schedule at this time. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay, F, uh, F, five is me. Chairman's, Chairwoman's announcements. Um, the first thing that I would like to bring up has to do with our subcommittee meetings. Um, this is no blaming anybody. We have kind of gotten into this groove and we have to get out of the groove. I will not entertain votes or put items on the agenda that I don't have minutes to a meeting for in the future. And what that means is Thursday night meetings prior to a town council meeting will no longer be allowed 
unless in emergency situations. Those meetings come too late for an agenda item to be placed except inserting it and hoping that it gets voted on. I don't like that. I want to be transparent and I want anybody who wants to have a meeting on a Thursday night will have to have that Thursday night meeting after the town council meeting that week, but not the Thursday before the town council. So I'd like um, the chairs of the subcommittees to keep that in mind when scheduling their, their meetings in the future. I received in my packet a letter. It was addressed to the town council, and I'd like to read it. It's from a gentleman who lives in Woodstock Valley, Connecticut. And the subject is medical emergency services. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm writing this to you to thank and express my gratitude to your medical emergency staff, especially Mr. Jacques Kalanian. I suffered a heart attack while working out at the Y on October 22nd, 2011, and did not have a pulse. I suffer, I, within minutes, the emergency staff arrived, revived me, and put me on life support. They transported me immediately to UMass Memorial Medical Center. Subsequently, through medical care, I have recovered completely. I am told by all the UMass physicians that if it were not for the prompt and correct response from your medical emergency staff, I would not be here today. Thank you for having such superb and competent emergency medical care providers on your staff. Sincerely, Sugato, Sugato Mitra. And this gentleman lives in Woodstock Valley, Connecticut. I wanted to read that because oftentimes the only stuff we get up here is negative. And this is a very, not only is it, it's not a general, we do a great job, our, our emergency medical services do a great job. We say that often, but this is a specific. And I've asked the manager to place this in uh, Mr. Kalanian's personnel file because I think that kudos are in order. Um, I'm not surprised, but it's nice to hear somebody actually take the time to send us something like this. So I wanted to read it to you. I also just wanted to bring up, there are a couple of things coming up this weekend. On Saturday, March 31st, there is a free rabies clinic that will be held at the old DPW barn on Pleasant Street. Um, Second Chance Animal Shelter will be providing free rabies vaccines for dogs and cats. Dogs must be on a leash and cats must be in a carrier. The vaccines are free for the first 500 pets. Only $5 will be charged for each pet after the first 500. It's from 9 a.m. till 12 noon at the DPW barn on Saturday, March 31st. Also, this Saturday will be Household Hazardous Waste Day up at the uh, Casella facility. Um, I don't, unfortunately, I don't have the hours, but it's always in the morning. So I just wanted to remind anybody that if they have any items that they want to bring up to the um, facility, it will be Saturday, March 31st. And it's, thank you, Counselor, it's from 9 to 1. That's all I have. Um, agenda item number 6, Town Manager's Announcements, Mr. Clark. Thank you, Madam Chair. I do have uh, several items this evening. Uh, the first one is just a, a more of an item of note uh, that the state has finally promulgated a, uh, on the ethics reform law that was promulgated in 2009. They had online training, but for municipal officials, it was actually the same as the, what state officials take. And they have finally updated and they have an exam that is designed for municipal officials. Uh, for folks that already have taken the training, we will not be required to retrain until the two years is up. And I think we just recently went through a recycling, yeah. not a recycling, a retraining uh, opportunity, but for new employees. So we will be coordinating that uh, for any new hires that come on board. And apparently the state has this, uh, it's called Performance and Career Enhancement uh, Online Training uh, Module that they are um, rolling out. So we will organize that and make sure we get that implemented accordingly. <clears throat> the next, uh, we were successful in getting the, uh, the yard waste collection and drop off open. 
<clears throat> so we have that facility open down at the uh, Gulfwood Road facility, uh, just on the other side of the building. And just a reminder to folks that uh, no plastic bags. It is a uh, leaf dumpster, uh, leaf and, and small branches. Um, all yard waste must be placed inside of the dumpster and the brush must not exceed four feet in length and not more than four inches in diameter. Uh, so that is available now. We also have uh, the yard waste curbside collection program is, is commencing uh, fairly shortly for a limited time only beginning on Monday, April 16th and ending on Saturday, May 26th. If you put out your yard waste on collection day in open top containers or in paper yard, uh, paper yard waste bags, <clears throat> the bags are available at Dick's Hardware, Hometown, Big Bunny and Big Y. Um, let me see, absolutely no plastic bags will be accepted and please don't put any sand or dirt in the bags. And again, the same criteria exists that four feet in length, no more than four inches in diameter. So that runs uh, as part of your normal pickup from Monday, April 16th to Saturday, May 26th. We also have, um, and this will be advertised shortly, um, we are gonna do a, a public hearing on the uh, water and sewer rates. I'm just gonna read it because it's fairly short. Uh, the town manager of the town of Southbridge will hold a public hearing on Thursday, April 19th at 7 p.m. in the McKinnon Council Chamber second floor of town hall on the proposed rate schedule. The increase is 0%, that's 0% for water and 2% for sewer, effective with all bills issued after July 1st, 2012. Those wishing to speak on this matter will be given an opportunity to do so. The current and proposed rates are on display in the office of the town manager. So if you're interested in that, uh, you're more than welcome to attend. We probably will have the vendors for the water and sewer come out if there are questions about the way we operate the water and sewer collection system in the community. <clears throat> Just on one other item, we did send out a uh, revised agenda. I believe that uh, some of these topics were already uh, covered, but just so people are aware, uh, item nine, I think the, uh, the increase on the HMO should be 1.58%. We listed at 1.6. I think it's just simple rounding on that one. But then we also did do um, under item 13, which involves the uh, acquisition of materials relative to the school project. Uh, there were two items that came up at subcommittee. These were both items that had been discussed at previous meetings. Uh, but we're not complete and have been completed subsequent. Um, so that is 13A and 13B. And then lastly, on item 15, in regards to the, uh, the Bay Path School Project, uh, the wording has been put in in its entirety. Uh, the wording had been put in as part of the notice with just an attachment. So we wanted to make sure that that was much more obvious with what we were doing, so we did post that. Uh, more descriptively within the posting, but in the subcommittee ma materials, this material was in there, so it's not additional information, it's just shown in a more <clears throat> overt way. But with those uh, few changes, and those, do, those are reflected in the materials that I distributed this evening, I think that we should have um, everything we need. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Clark. Um, okay, agenda item number seven is swearing in and presentation time. At this point, we're going to have the presentation of the FY 2013 budget, budget message from our town manager. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I will do this as uh, succinctly and as comprehensively as I can, and certainly uh, questions at the end are always uh, welcome. Um, I am proud to, uh, I think this is the fourth budget I've had an opportunity to work on since I've been here with the town. Uh, so this is the FY13 budget. As per usual, I made sure that the budget presentation includes a balanced budget for FY13. And what I'd like to do in, in tonight's presentation is do a kind of an overview of where we are in, in terms of the budget and highlight um, different things. One, just one item of note, each of the councilors received a, a fairly substantial budget book. And I would just, before I make sure I don't forget, 
if individual subcommittee chairs could get a hold of uh, Yvonne to start scheduling meetings in April, uh, we can start to have the digest the information and, and review the information. And we will be headed towards a, a May budget approval for the 2013 per usual. <coughs> Just by way of um, <coughs> by way of comment, the uh, 2013 budget is balanced. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to kind of point out in the budget message includes this uh, up front <coughs> that in the time that I've been with the community, I have endeavored each year to make sure that we have uh, modest increases and to try to have some consistency. I think that the general public and the, and the business community uh, needs to have some consistency from its um, financial team and what we present obviously to, to the elected officials. Uh, ultimately, it's the elected officials that make the determination on the budget allocations. But during the budget cycle of from 2009 to 2013, the average tax increase, not counting the new growth, was 3.57%. And this is average over the various, over the various classes, so 3.57, with a low of 2.39 that was accomplished last year and a high of, in 2011, of 4.49. When you take that four-year cycle versus the four years previously, the average tax increase was 6.33%, with a high of 12.30 and a low of 1.85. So a much more erratic pattern. So what we've tried to bring, not only myself, but the finance team in the time that I've been here is, again, consistency so people have a, a sense for what to expect. On the water and sewer rates, we've been much more successful in keeping that range narrower. Uh, the rate range over the three-year cycle is 2.6%, with a high of 3% and a low of 2%. Uh, again, that's the combined water and sewer average. For 2006 to 2009, the combined water and sewer we averaged 24.45% with a high of 44 and a low of 13%. So I think that we've been um, very successful, uh, the management team, in making sure that we're able to keep those uh, rates at modest levels. Uh, that doesn't just happen. Uh, that comes from a lot of hard work from the management team. Uh, also, I think it comes from having a, a good dialogue and a good relationship with the various town unions. Uh, certainly, labor costs are a significant part of any budget. And as you'll see in the budget presentation, there are several different items that are fairly significant that we do try to take into account in the way we do the, um, the budgeting. But I just wanted to, to kind of talk a little bit. That was a philosophy that I wanted to bring when I came, what I promised I would do. And you know, I'm happy to say that not only through my efforts, but really through the finance team efforts, as well as the department heads, I think we've been fairly successful in, in accomplishing that. And that hasn't been without struggle. Uh, certainly, we've had a, a very, diff very difficult cycle the last four years. So if we could um, just kind of flip through the first couple. Per the, uh, what I've done in the past, I have several slides. Some of these slides are smaller. We, we have decided to break some of them out. So if you can't read uh, some of these, we have a uh, little bit larger versions to come. Um, but we have different, different sections that we'll cover tonight. Uh, revenue expense summary, which is what you have in front of you tonight. A historic file on spending, a comparison of the 2013 to 2012 budget. A revenue expenditure forecast with a projection model, a debt strategy uh, to talk about the uh, general, general fund debt as well as enterprise debt uh, consisting of water and sewer, uh, some discussion of the capital plan, and then reserves. So on this section, um, what you see, which again is hard to read, it's just here how we have actually formally balanced the budget. So for general fund related budget, the total amount of revenue, actually the total amount of expenses contemplated in the budget are 46,513,248. So that is what we have balanced the budget to that number. Uh, this number is exclusive of uh, the water and sewer enterprise accounts. But that's the, the number that we've been able to balance to uh, 46 million. 513248 is the total 
um, the total budget. If we can switch to the, uh, the budget comparison or move to the budget comparison, hopefully this chart's a little bit easier to, to read, hopefully. I'll take that as hopefully, more hope than uh, fu fully. But um, just to kind of go through on some of these, that what we wanted to, um, to highlight in this, that under the property tax, uh, we do anticipate using the full 2012 uh, excess levy capacity as well as the allowable prop two and a half increase. Plus we have a contemplated 200,000 for new growth. Uh, in the time that I've been here, we've targeted about 100,000. But in a revaluation year, it's, it's always uh, in a revalue year that you get a little bit more new growth. So we have decided to uh, increase that number in the hopes of trying to moderate some of the tax increase. And then, um, and what does that mean in terms of new growth? Sometimes these terms are just floated out there. And really a, a good example of new growth is if there's a uh, vacant piece of property that somebody comes along and develops on that piece of property, well, the town valued it as raw land the first year and then it would capture that property as a, as a new home, as an example, as new growth. So it's a, a term for improvements made to various uh, parcels in the community. We have uh, in this budget plan, we do have at this point, uh, the budget amount for the property tax is around 4.2%. I think we were in that range last year, and last year, or the, this current fiscal year we're in, we were able to bring it in at 2.39%, one of the lower years. So we are in the range that we have historically been in. And any th amount that we do get in over 200,000 in new growth will be utilized to uh, decrease the tax levy, and that is something that we have done in the, uh, in the last three budgets. This um, budget is also predicated upon uh, the governor's numbers, uh, reflect increases for uh, Chapter 70, a leveling of what's called the uh, unrestricted general government aid. That unrestricted general government aid consists of uh, lottery revenues, is probably one of the primary funding sources for that. And just a uh, item of note uh, that we do predicate this on House 2, which is the governor's numbers. If those numbers are not adopted, then that would put the, uh, the budget out of balance. We won't know what those final numbers are until, until realistically till the end of June or the, even the beginning of July. So what we've done in the past, and this has served us fairly well, uh, is to follow the governor's numbers starting off. One area that we have in the, uh, in the line item that we have had a, uh, a decrease in the revenue side is we have had a decrease in the amount of free cash that's been available to us. We had originally targeted about a million dollars and in this budget plan we only have 830,000. That 830,000 is what was actually uh, approved by the Department of Revenue. So that is a, a lesser number than we had uh, had previously. So that is an item of concern. Why is that number down? Uh, we are below the target of a million dollars, really due, for, due to two primary reasons. Uh, one is that we had a tornado at the end of June of 2011. That's the last month of the fiscal year. And that we had about probably $200,000 that was taken out of various departments in order to meet that need. So we had a, uh, a situation where the community needed the resources that we had to offer and we allocated 200,000 out of uh, budgets that would have otherwise gone on towards that free cash number. Um, and so that was a, a major part of that. We will see some of that money as we work our way through the FEMA process. Uh, so some of those dollars will be coming back to us um, and some of those we actually have in place already but won't be available for appropriation until we get to the December cycle, December tax setting cycle. And then also um, we had a need for a uh, ambulance replacement. So we actually had, um, we came up with 190,000 cash uh, this year to replace the uh, ambulance. So that also, we kind of hurt ourselves in those two areas by taking more cash to pay for these things. Um, but that was one of the things I think in both cases, they were kind of uh, things that needed to be done in a uh, timely fashion. And just a note here that we have been able to migrate down, I mean, during some very difficult fiscal times that we went from in 2009, 
we had $3 million in, uh, in this free cash down to 2.3, and those figures were just not sustainable. So we have um, moved those numbers down, and in the budget plan, we have uh, looked to migrate that number down even further to 750000 So if we do have unforeseen uh, items that come up, we will gain a little bit of additional flexibility. On uh, local receipts, which is a, uh, another major revenue center for us, um, and this is actually kind of an interesting one, that we, I think we had a modest decrease in local receipts. Uh, one of the issues that we ran into is that as the federal government attempts to balance its budget, it generally reduces the amount of reimbursements under Medicare and Medicaid that the town receives. And those uh, decreases for us uh, resulted in about $175,000 shortfall in those accounts, and that's money that will not be coming back and money that has to be uh, made up. The good news is in other areas, things got a little bit better, so we were able to adjust some of those numbers up. And a couple years ago, we adopted the uh, local meals tax, which now accounts for about $100,000 uh, in revenue. So that has helped to offset some of those reductions in, um, in the Medicaid and Medicare funding. We also had some uh, adjustments to the transfer. That number is actually uh, fairly large. It shows 110000 some of that is that on the uh, access road debt, we actually received some additional payments earlier than what the debt schedule called for. And as that debt ramps up, we, will, we have transferred that money. And because we've transferred that, that, that shows up on this chart. So it has been adjusted. But there's really no, um, no real financial impact to the town. The commitment that was made on the commercial drive has continued to be adhered to, that there's the, no taxpayer dollars are going into that. That is money that was dedicated as part of the Casella funding agreement. It's just matching up the revenue source with the uh, debt schedule. And that has had a, a little bit of a, a ripple effect in the budget. Really more of an item of note than, than anything else. We do also have on the um, expense, uh, I'm sorry, on the, on the revenue side that we do anticipate at some point we have several pieces of property uh, for sale that we are uh, attempting to sell. And uh, we have, again, not put those sales into this uh, budget, but once those sales are effectuated that they would be uh, put into a fund and would have to be used for certain limited purposes. Uh, certainly debt service is one, as well as capital improvements is another. Uh, but we have not planned for those yet, um, hoping that those sales will occur, but not f officially planning for it. To move to the uh, expense side of the budget, um, we had a few issues, and these will be uh, elaborated a little later in the presentation, uh, but school choice is, is one that, again, uh, we will talk about in more detail at a later opportunity. On the town operating costs, uh, the total for all town departments is a $190,000 increase, which reflects a 1.7% increase in those departments. This is police, fire, DPW, and town hall. Uh, there were a few items that were additional, uh, kind of above the um, inflation rate, if you want to, if you want to call it that. Uh, the council recording clerk, uh, as we've gotten uh, better minutes and lengthier minutes, uh, the amount of hours as well as the hours of the council meetings for some reason this year has expanded more than previous. So we had to allocate additional money for that. In the town manager's budget, we put in some additional resources to fund a part-time confidential clerk that specializes in human resources. Uh, it had been my hope that we would be able to get a, uh, a full-time person in there to be able to deal with some of the human resources issues that we have. I think the need is, is, is very much here and, and present, but um, in terms of balancing the budget, it just didn't, it didn't measure up in, in my mind that we commit that extra funding to that purpose. In terms of the union and non-union cost of living adjustments, uh, we will put in this year for all full-time and part-time non-union members a 1% uh, basically cost of living increase. Uh, and we do have two agreements that are currently settled. Uh, the town hall and library unit being one is settled for next year at 1%. 
and the fire union contract is settled at 1% for next year. Uh, the DPW union contract expires uh, this June and the police union contract expired last, last June. Uh, we are in negotiations and have been in negotiations with the police union and the DPW. We will uh, start to schedule those meetings in the, uh, in the springtime here going into summer. But the, uh, the, the labor costs in those areas uh, make up a, a, a fairly good portion of that 190,000. I think it's between 100 to 110 as memory serves. And then we also had out of that 190, there was about 75,000 that we put in for heating and electricity costs. And this is something that for planning purposes, uh, the town, when it takes control of the middle school, when the school department moves over to the new facility on Torrey Road, uh, the, the middle school will become vacant. Uh, we cannot, cannot leave that building uh, without heat. So we cannot winterize it because we will lose the building in a timely fashion. And that is a significant capital asset for this community. So um, the town um, will receive that building back from the school committee and we have to have some budget plans to address that. Uh, we are looking right now at different options to try to mitigate some of the costs for operating that school, but it's a 100,000 square foot school um, that we need to make sure that we um, keep in, in a fairly good capacity so we're able to, uh, to resell it. And we have already reached out to try to find uh, folks that may have an interest in that building. Uh, so far, nothing has come to fruition and we would have to competitively bid the uh, sale of that building. But the council has already officially voted to have that building as surplus. I think that vote took place probably about two years ago. So uh, we are continuing with that. On the retirement side, uh, retirement has gone up by 5.66%, about 133,000, and that's per the new 2040 funding schedule, which last year we changed the 2030 funding schedule, moving it back to 2040 because of the, uh, the stock market losses over the last three or four years that had to be adjusted. Uh, if that had been retained at the 2030 level, that number would be significantly higher. On uh, group health insurance and debt, I'll get to that when we talk about uh, some of the selected budget items. The school department, uh, the Southbridge Public Schools, we've increased their budget by 2.59%, about $600,000. Uh, to try to help them meet the challenges that lay ahead in operating the new middle high school. Uh, in terms of, I know this question's come up, so we have put it in the uh, materials, that as of uh, the 2013, the projected net school spending worksheet, we are uh, greater than, slightly greater than 800,000 over that amount. On Bay Path, uh, Vocational Technical School, which you'll hear some more details tonight, um, as children have decided to stay in the Southbridge public school system, uh, that has had a positive impact from a budget perspective in some respects to having um, the number of enrollees go down at Bay Path, which is resulting in a savings for the town. Uh, this year, uh, the Bay Path folks, which I think do an outstanding job on their, on their budgeting, and it's simply a formula-driven calculation. So as enrollments go down, the assessments get reapportioned. Re that that is a, a savings of 165,000. Um, this is probably one of the most toughest decisions I think I've had to make in the time that I've been here. It was my intent originally to try to keep that 165,000 uh, to try to put towards the uh, the Bay Path schools. And due to some of the mechanisms in the debt exclusion um, override process, I, we opted to then to just opt to uh, propose that to the council that a debt exclusion be uh, put forth for the school construction instead of trying to, to be diligent in keeping that money in the budget and trying to build that up. Uh, I thought that that would lead to um, really just significant additional hardship on the community if we were to attempt to do that. Uh, but more on that topic of the funding of the school will, will come later. But for this budget, the, um, the assessment has gone down by 165,000. The overall budget increase um, 
taking into account all budget items was 2.22%, so a fairly modest increase, 2.22%. Uh, a few things that you'll see in the budget for uh, different initiatives this year, um, we are retaining on the uh, fire operations the two uh, positions that we funded this past year, which only fairly recently came into operation to try to help improve our ambulance uh, runs. We, we actually could cover more ambulance runs with these two people in position. Uh, we have, achie have achieved those two people in positions and they are now operating that schedule and have done so only for the last couple weeks. So we do, we do anticipate keeping that in the effort of trying to improve our ambulance uh, revenues, which are significant. And then two other additional items that we're looking at is to shift the uh, call department, which is currently a uh, stipend operation into a more uh, pay for training and a pay for uh, responding to calls. So that is one that we will move to uh, work into that direction. And then the other one would also be um, on the fire alarm call box. This is a technology that was, I think, much more prevalent in uh, earlier generations and not as prevalent today. So we will be rescoping and resizing that to try to meet some of the larger needs of the business community and the larger housing complexes. But this is one that uh, really due to private services and due to cell phones, uh, I don't know if people even fully know what the call box system is anymore. So we are gonna try to appropriately size that. Um, and just to what it is, uh, for folks that are probably laughing at me saying, I don't know what it is. A call box is actually is usually a, a red box that's located strategically throughout the community that has a little pull lever and if, there's a, um, if you have a need for a fire department personnel, you can go over and theoretically you could pull that and that sets off an alarm in the fire station. And you know, before the days of telephone, certainly before the days of cell phones, when you had isolated areas, this was one mechanism, fairly effective mechanism at its, in its day to be able to get uh, emergency personnel to your area. But now, like I said, with the advent of cell phones and, and some of these other private services, it's not as, not as prevalent. And really, the number of calls that we receive on that is very, very modest. On uh, DPW operations, we have the uh, custodian uh, position that we had at 115 Marcy Street. We have been able to effectuate the reassignment. But as long as we own the 115 Marcy Street, we do have a cleaning contract that's necessary to uh, continue to clean that facility. On the economic development side, we do hope that through some of the sales of property at Commercial Drive, which this council has voted fairly recently to authorize, that we hope to uh, capture some of those dollars and to try to put in or try to hire uh, probably an outside firm to help us market the, com market the town in a, a more comprehensive way. And we do have several properties, as I've alluded to earlier, uh, 62 Pleasant Street, which is the former DPW barn, uh, 70 Foster Street, the former Water Department building, 115 Marcy Street, currently uh, used by Worcester Community Action Council and the YMCA for a, uh, a extended day type of program for little ones. And then 114 Pleasant Street, which is used by Worcester Community Action Council, it's also a leased facility. And then as alluded to earlier, 80 Marcy Street, which is the middle school, uh, that once we move to the middle high school, that facility will be uh, opened up. This budget also uh, has some positives in it and how those positives are used uh, are outlined in here for some suggestions. Uh, certainly the Casello contract, the waste tonnage has moved from 180,000 tons up to 300,000 tons. And during FY13, uh, provided everything goes accordingly, you should achieve the final permitted amount of 405. Uh, that is significant dollars, but those dollars where they are significant are limited, that the landfill, once the landfill closes, it closes, and all that revenue goes away. So, uh, and the landfill has anywhere from really 11 to 15 years of life left in it. So it's certainly something that on the time horizon is, is really not that far, far out. 
So because of the type of funding source that the landfill offers to the community, what we've tried to do is to match up uh, what those funding sources are and try to use those towards building reserves, funding a thing called OPEB, which is other post-employment benefits. Uh, our obligation for those are in excess of $40 million. So it's a significant amount of money, and that's something that we have not, have not begun to fund, and we do seriously need to begin to fund that because that obligation is coming uh, as folks retire. Uh, the, 40, the over $40 million doesn't come at one bill. It does come over time, but it is something that um, I believe the state and good financial practices wants to see a, a community address. Also, uh, we hope to fund uh, some of the debt and capital expenses out of that revenue. We also have a, a few other positives. Uh, we have the methane to electricity, so the, we have a revenue source on that that's coming in for utilizing landfill gas to generate electricity. Uh, so far, that has been fairly modest dollars as those tonnages increase and as additional generators are put online, that money should hopefully increase. And we have not yet fully dedicated that towards uh, what the use of that revenue would be. That revenue source with the landfill only has a potentially 11 to 15 year life cycle to it. The methane would last for about 20 to 25 years beyond that. So that is a, uh, a, longer, a longer time cycle, long enough for me to uh, be well into retirement before we get to the end of that. Um, and then lastly, we did uh, go out for a uh, bid for solar farm and we did receive uh, three proposals on a uh, solar facility up at the uh, airport and we are contemplating doing a, uh, an additional one and those are revenues that could be used to help offset some of our electrical costs or used in the form of a lease where it would be actual revenue that the town receives in. Uh, just one other, again, uh, item of note that if these balanced budget recommendations do not come to fruition and the budget falls out of balance, that it would be necessary to effectuate reductions consistent with reductions made previously and that we do have an agreement with the uh, school department that they would absorb 61% of those cuts and the town would absorb 39%, which is a rough approximation of the current spending levels of the various departments. And these numbers are consistent with last year. Just to move now to the uh, historic budget, just to kind of look a little bit from 2008 to 2012, it's kind of hard to go through some of those past years and, and these charts um, really just a lot of numbers. Uh, we will have these on the town website for folks that want to, uh, to look at them probably in the next day or so. The one thing that's interesting here, just going through some of the numbers, is that when you look that the local property tax in 2008 was 31.1% of the budget and then up to 2012 it went up to 35.6%. So a 4% increase, almost a 4.5% increase in the percent of the, of the budget that, that local taxpayers are meeting uh, that the state is no longer. And the flip side of that is obvious that the state aid from 2008 made up 48% of the budget, where today in 2012 it's only 44%. So you can see there has been a shifting from the state revenue sources to local revenue sources and that's necessitated the, the property taxes being, um, being increased. Just on the projection model, if we can go to that one, really on the projection model, one of the key things is at the bottom of the screen, you can see that there's um, pro a lot of negative numbers. So as we try to balance the budget going forward, uh, if we use kind of the basis of what we've had the last several years, that we have shortfalls of about um, 233,000, almost 300,000, 338, 386, and 496 over that five-year period. Obviously, 2013 is balanced. Some of the reasons for that is that when you look at the, um, the health insurance costs uh, we have in this budget projection going forward, about a 7% increase. We also put in here a fairly modest for the town operating budget of 2%. You can see this year we actually had a 1.7 and the school a 2.5.
that without some additional revenue coming in, uh, we are going to be hard pressed to kind of meet those obligations at those levels. So I think that when we have the opportunity to do solar, when we have an opportunity to uh, promote the town and market the town and start to develop the industrial park, uh, if we can get those new growth numbers into the three and four hundred thousand dollar range as opposed to the one hundred and two hundred thousand dollar ranges, uh, that should significantly help. And one thing we'll see on the, the slides, uh, if state aid were more consistent, that would uh, obviously help tremendously uh, in terms of us doing the, doing the budgeting. And just, it was actually interesting, uh, you'll see on some of these slides that the landfill royalty numbers do uh, go up significantly as those tonnages go up. But when you take the overall budget increase, that $2.2 .2 million increase is about a million dollars if the budget, just in general, were to go up by 4.4%, double that number, that would be a $2 million increase. So even with the landfill revenues, it would not be sufficient monies to sustain an, a town-wide budget increase uh, and an operations increase. So even though the landfill royalty is going to be additional money, it's money that has to be looked at as being money that is uh, set aside for specific purposes. We already uh, rely upon a million dollars of that landfill royalty to offset operating costs. So in that 15 year cycle for the landfill, we already have an issue of having to wean off of in that, within that 15 years, that million dollars from uh, the royalty revenue. And just, I know I've said this before in the past, I keep these phrases in here. As we go out, the, uh, the information obviously is much better the closer we are. FY13 is much better than FY18. Um, it's just, uh, when you look at the history file, you can see things go up and down. It's tough to really identify some trends. Now the next section, this is a new section that we put into the budget, and I think graphically this should uh, help us to walk through a couple of the fairly larger ones. Uh, this is select budget. Here you can see the, uh, the cherry sheets, and on the cherry sheet, this is money that we receive from the state. And in FY 2008 and 2009, we had a, a fairly good level, and then it dropped off in 2010 and 2011. It's not a coincidence that our tax increases were highest in 2010 and 2011 in the time that I've been here, quite frankly, because we're trying to make up for a shortfall that, um, existed because of the state. In 2013, which is the yellow bar, uh, that shows where we hope to be, and even that is still not back to the levels of 2008. So we are making some improvement, and that does assume the governor's budget is utilized. And then in the out years, we, we hope, uh, certainly, that the state would be able to fund their obligation at about 2.5% increase. So that just reflects a um, I hope that the level would continue to, uh, to moderate up. And then on the next one is meals tax. Uh, we actually introduced the uh, meals tax back in uh, FY 2010. Uh, the first year of it was a partial year, came in at over $60,000. And we do have that now at 100,000. As I indicated earlier, uh, you know, this is one of the key factors to helping to moderate some of the losses in Medicare and Medicaid by having this revenue uh, be a more stable source for us. As you can see, this isn't something that's gonna, we're gonna be able to balance the budget on perpetually, but it is something to help to uh, stabilize our budget. The next one is school choice. Um, this chart is, is probably one of the scariest ones, but if you look uh, really in the, in the years, the uh, 2008 to 2011, if that, if that chart were to continue, um, we would be hard pressed to uh, to make the budget work, and with the new school coming online, uh, we have seen uh, not only, as I alluded to earlier, a decrease in the uh, the Bay Path um, assessment, but we've also seen the school choice has started to level off. Uh, certainly, it's this administration's firmest hope that, uh, provided that the the community rallied behind the new facility and with the uh, the, the new the faculty that is over at the school department that they can not only the new school I believe will attract students but it's going to be the turnaround program that would hopefully keep the new students in the in the school and if we can 
reverse that trend and, and have more people stay in our system, then we would help uh, that significantly. To be perfectly honest, if we go back to the, the trend that existed the four years previously, I mean, there's just, we'd be hard pressed to, um, to continue to balance the budget. On group health and life, I think this is a, uh, an interesting chart. Obviously, uh, group health and life, this is uh, the 50%, which is really the town portion, and uh, the other 50% is shared by the employees. You can see that we've had some success in this. Uh, in the first couple years, we were able to have modest uh, growth because we had good claims experience. Uh, but in recent years, the claims experience has not been as favorable. Uh, we were able to work with the unions in 2011 to work with them to do additional cost sharing. And what we were able to do, as you can see in that, we actually were able to decrease the town's cost uh, in 2011. Uh, in 2000, I'm sorry, 2012. As you can see in uh, 2013, we do have an increase in there. Uh, we have worked with the unions and it was a anticipated that it would be a 8.9% increase. And with working with the unions and working with our insurance company, that will moderate to two points, I'm sorry, to one point. 5.8%, uh, that's for the largest HMO that we have, uh, that we offer. The PPO would still be at the 8.9%, but that's a much smaller part of our uh, pool. And we also take into account or plan for some of the retiree uh, plans as well. So that's why you see that growing. But I think we originally were contemplating almost $200,000 in an increase for the town, and that's been moderated down to, I believe it's $76,000. So we've done a, a fairly effective job of, of taming, taming that um, item. But that is a, a continual struggle as uh, the feds change requirements and, and so on. So it, it is something that uh, we have to look at. The other driving factor in this is that we have a state, the, the state wants us to move more closer to the, uh, the GIC which is the, um, the General Insurance Committee uh, of the state. And they, they are trying to force cities and towns to adopt some of the plan designs that they have there, which we are attempting to do to, to try to stay in compliance before they force us to come into compliance. The next one is on uh, unemployment compensation. On unemployment compensation, this covers un uh, workers' compensation um, I think we skipped over one. Yeah, there it is, okay. We did skip over one. On the unemployment compensation, we, we, don't, we haven't shown this in the past, but one of the things that was kind of interesting on this is that in 2008, we spent $70,000 for unemployment compensation. And that number has skyrocketed to over $250,000. And we need to work more constructively. Um, a large, large portion of this uh, actually comes on the school side. So we need to really meet and try to understand better with the, uh, the school officials, the, the superintendent and the business manager, because uh, you know these fiscal shocks are very difficult for us to address and they lead to issues for us. And so this is an area where we just need to um, really try to hone in and, and do a better job uh, on this. So we will start to focus, but we wanted to kind of at least alert the council that this is something that has created some fiscal stress for the community and something that hopefully we can get under better control in the long run. Now to the next. On the workers' compensation, this is actually um, kind of a, the, Kind of an interesting, interesting story. When we came in, we had uh, one vendor. Uh, we had that vendor for a long time. We were able to co go out competitively bid the service, and as you can see, in 2009 to 2010, we uh, were able to effectuate a fairly significant drop. Uh, this is kind of what we always want to do, always want to accomplish. If you can find something and, and improve the operation of it to make it more uh, efficient. We certainly want to do that, and as you can see, we've, we've been successful. 
However, um, when you have a tornado in which the losses for this community were about a million dollars, when you have a new school coming online that adds value to the community, I think our total assessed value for insurance purposes was about $150 million. With this new school coming online, this new school by itself could be $50 million in value, 200,000 square feet of new building space, so additional material for us to have to insure. So you can see that this has created a lot of uh, fiscal stress. Uh, just having bad claims experience because of the tornado um, has really come home to roost. We do obtain the insurance privately now, so we are assessed based upon our own loss experience. But uh, So this has created a fairly good amount of fiscal stress for us. Um, and certainly what you see here is that it will go up. Uh, hopefully our claims experience, which had been good prior to the tornado, will come back. And hopefully we'll be able to moderate that again as the, the marketplace. But there's really not too much you can do when you have um, a bad, bad claims run. And then on the, uh, the debt structure, just to um, talk about this a little bit. On this chart, the, um, the orange bar at the top, this is a combination of all the town's existing and proposed debt. Uh, the proposed debt, the, the yellow, not the yellow, the, the tan part that you see is the school building project, our school building project for the new middle high school. This is predicated upon a $18 million borrowing. This is also predicated on a, on a repayment schedule that is not traditional, that has some flexibility in it. Um, I know in the past I've referred to this as kind of an opportunity to feather in the debt to take off some of the initial front years and, and back end load it to a degree. So you can see in this chart the blue line is prop two and a half. So provided we're able to borrow the $18 million number, uh, we can fairly easily keep within the prop two and a half debt. Um, one of the things I keep saying is $18 million. Uh, we actually have 20 million is what the town's obligation is. When I started doing the financing plan on this, I believe all the appraised values of all the buildings that we're attempting to sell is about $6 million. So I was hoping that we would be able to realize about a third of that. Uh, to date, we have not realized any of it. So we are putting together contingency plans, uh, which include utilizing some of the landfill royalty, um, one of the other things we've had is the debt structure has been more favorable, the markets are more favorable, so we will come back with a plan that I don't know if we'll be able to get the full $2 million that we had originally contemplated, but I think we will be able to get a portion of it. How big of a portion if we're able to sell some of these buildings in the most recent um, offerings that we have, certainly that's going to help. So uh, in terms of the landfill revenue, just in terms of order of magnitude, uh, for FY13, prior to uh, having to permanently finance this, the, the landfill revenue by itself could be close to a million dollars available to us to offset this. So we, we do have some opportunities in this. If we do get, obviously, some of the buildings sold, selling the buildings is critical because selling the buildings decreases the insurance obligations the town has decreases the carrying costs that we have and gives us cash on hand to to help us with the debt so um i can't underest i can't uh, under emphasize the uh, the critical importance of being able to sell some of these town assets and these are assets that the com that the council has already voted on as declaring as surplus just quickly, uh, we have the water debt. You can see in the water debt, uh, that's actually a, a better debt schedule to have. We do have fairly significant capital uh, work that needs to be done, but certainly having a debt schedule that is falling off uh, gives us an opportunity to go in and, and address some of the water needs that we do have. Um, so we should be able to continue to moderate rates uh, have modest increases at the most, but also be able to meet some of the capital infrastructure that has been lacking for several years. When you switch to the sewer side, um, much less room, much less capacity. 
Uh, what we're looking for here is to bring the industrial park online, bring new users online, that really what would be helpful is if we can increase the number of users, increase the amount of material that we receive down at the plant, that should give us some capacity. But as you can see, there's, there's no real opportunity to feather in debt here. Uh, the debt levels were pre-established and have been high and, and remain fairly constantly high for the foreseeable future. On the capital budget, I'm not going to go through all these, but we did list off. Um, you can see uh, there's fairly significant amount of capital that's out there um, in the charts, not in the charts, but in the um, spreadsheet. You can see for uh, 2013 for DPW alone, it's almost $2 million. For the um, water, uh, I'm sorry, sewer operations, about a million and a half in 2013 and water is just over a million. Um, so the, you can see those are fairly significant numbers, uh, but numbers that we will be looking to tackle. The other thing is on the capital, uh, we have been able to, we paid for the ambulance with cash. We have looked at our debt structure. We do have an obligation to keep the debt structure at that two and a half levy limit uh, chart that we showed. So we will be looking at putting together a capital plan of about $300,000 for 2012 and 2013 to try to address some of the needs, as you can see on the, the next sheet on that. That when you take fire department, they have a 405,000, the library 200,000, police department 400,000. And there are a couple of town hall items that I'd like to also see if we can address. Um, so there, there's significant need out there, and we will do what we can do to balance those needs and get done what's urgently needing to be done and to try to plan for those other items over time. On the reserve fund balances, uh, if we go to that one, you can see um, the spike in the chart in 2008 was when we actually took the landfill from a enterprise operation and we put that into... Um, a separate into a different account that actually freed up a significant amount of money. The, the reason for the free up of the money was the, the obligation for the capping of the landfill was contemplated to be funded out of this account. And when that, uh, when that obligation was shifted onto, the, onto Casella, uh, that freed up available money for the town to be able to use. We have attempted to, to keep as much of that as we can. And you can see on that chart that there's a uh, blue line that runs throughout. That blue line is 10% of the operating budget. So what Moody's and Standard and & Poor's and other professional rating agencies would like to see from what they consider to be quality government is a target of somewhere between 8 and 12% uh, held aside in reserves. So when you have a tornado, you have different things that impact your community in a negative way. You have the resources to meet those needs. So here we are uh, keeping within that plan of between 8 and 12%. The salmon color bars, or the, the reddish brown bars at the end, uh, starting in 2013, would be the money that we would receive, the additional money from the additional tonnage for, from Casella. So that money we would have, uh, at least the plan would be to try to allocate that over time into primarily three different areas. Uh, some would be, to, uh, as I alluded to earlier, to pay down debt, uh, utilized to fund for some of the capital. Uh, other amount of that money could be used to uh, begin to fund in a more serious way the OPEB obligations that the community has. And then lastly, we could put the money into uh, stabilization and fund for purposes of um, trying to build reserves and keeping us into that eight to 12% range. And finally, I don't have to speak anymore. <laughs> um, it's a lot of material. I realize a lot to digest. We will put that um, on the website for folks at home. Uh, we did try to add that feature on the charts to get into some of the specifics to make that a little bit more stand out. I think charts sometimes are able to send a better message than pure numbers are. Uh, if there are any specific questions, I'd be happy to entertain some now, but we do have the whole budget process to work our way through. Councillor Marcucci. Thank you, Madam Chair. To the town manager. 
Mr. Clark, in the unemployment compensation. Um, Counselor, speak into the mic a little bit. I can't, can't hear, hear you. Me? I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you to the town manager very quickly. Mr. Clark, in the unemployment compensation, have you had any dialogue with school officials that such a significant increase to $250,000? We've had some dialogue with the school officials. I mean, one thing that's important to keep in mind with unemployment compensation is, is there's primarily two ways that you can fund it. One is a percentage of your total payroll, which would be significant for us all the time. And then the second is a pay-as-you-go program. So you could see on those numbers in 2008 when we were at 70,000, that was a much more manageable number for us. But the last several years, it has gone up. Um, I know that we've raised the issue with the superintendent and the business manager um, back probably in 2009 when we had that first spike. And both of those folks are now gone. And we have a new superintendent and new business manager. And we have had some preliminary discussions with them about the budget and that, you know, this is an issue. This is something that we need to watch and, and be more cognizant of. Um, but the discussions have been fairly recent in terms of that. Uh, and one that we will kind of push to, to see because we kids, you know, it's like school choice. You know, it's, if it's left, uh, left to its own devices, it's going to be, continue to be detrimental to us. So we need to do something, but we've only really begun the discussion with the new administration. Okay, thank you. If you could just follow up with us, Mr. Clark, as you usually do, I would appreciate that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Counselor. <clears throat> Counselor Regis. Adding to Councillor Marcucci's question, um, you are suggesting decreasing the unemployment appropriation. In your preliminary discussions with the school department, does this funding, um, level of funding, is it going to, in their estimation, produce any additional layoffs or anything like that, any additional unemployment? I think in the 2013 budget, we didn't put in there the full amount of um, what we've had in the past in the hopes that um, we do accomplish or get a little better uh, in terms of those numbers. One of the things about the unemployment compensation that makes it a, uh, an interesting piece is that it tends to, to go very high at the beginning of the school year from September to February. And when we try to chart that, it, it would go significantly high. And then at least what we've found in the last couple years is it has moderated in the second half down to more reasonable levels. My hope and on some of this is when we met with the, um, the superintendent initially, the reaction was, well, it's a large labor force, it's a youthful labor force, and there's a lot of comings and goings of, of people. And it's, to some degree, it's, it's the business of schools was the answer I got. What I like to think is that uh, we have been in a cycle in which uh, the school department relied upon uh, federal stimulus funds for two years to kind of balance things. And then when they came last year in the budget cycle and said, well, we need, you know, not only do we need our 2%, but we also need to make up for those lost ARRA funds. And we said, no, they had to effectuate significant layoffs. And when I say we said no, and we didn't have the money to do it. So mm -hmm. I, I shouldn't be so um, like we had it and we didn't. The reality is we just didn't have the money. So I think to some degree, we've been in a, um, from a financial perspective in kind of a, a downturn cycle. And I think that we may continue that as we make the migration to the new school. Uh, certainly what in the time, and the reason why it's mostly school and not necessarily town, is that when we have opportunity on the town side, we've been downsizing through attrition. And I know the school downsizes through attrition but I think they don't do it necessarily, or they don't have an opportunity to do it as often as we do. So, um, you know, I, I think attrition really is a beneficial way to do it, and I think that's why on the town side we've had reductions in force, but because we've done it through attrition, it hasn't shown up on the unemployment, and they may not always have that opportunity to do that. 
but it's a discussion that we will have with them and just make sure that you know it can't continue. One of the things I think that was good is um, I think three years ago when I started, we, we focused on school choice and you can see that the school choice has, I think there's been efforts made to try to improve that. So I think we are seeing some results in that and I hope if we focus on this, kind of put the light of day on it, that we can focus on this more and the schools will focus on it more to see if we can manage that more effectively. I don't can know if that's a good answer or not, but it's, it's an honest answer that I can give you. You indicated in your, um, in your narrative that um, general government aid is virtually flat and the, this modest increase is more in Chapter 70? Correct. Um, so the net difference, of course, taking the school choice, the increase in the school choice assessment is about $340,000, give or take. Um, do we know how much of this uh, $600,000 increase in the school appropriation is transportation related? Actually, I, um, well, in terms of, and this is the way this community does it, I think the schools have officially voted a budget that's in excess of the 600,000. Mm -hmm. And I have communicated to the schools that originally I was hoping to get as high as 700,000. So they're aware of what those numbers are in the final budget version. And I, I had a meeting the other day in which I talked to a few folks from the school committee and I told them that it's 600,000. So they will have to go in and adjust their budget accordingly and how they adjust it and what numbers they allocate to that is really going to be kind of subject to what the school department comes in with their with their budget and how they address cuz i think their i think their request was 1.2 million is i think what i what i read so certainly if they came in with a a budget request of 1.2 and and we can only afford to to allocate 600 they have some hard choices to make from from my perspective, um, you know, certainly that was one of the largest increases that we had of any budget, uh, of any department, to give them 2.59%. So we have tried to do everything that we believe we can do in-house to try to help them meet those needs. But again, this is one where, you know, quite frankly, there's only so much money in the budget and we can only go so far and this is what we believe that we're able to do and sustain a, a reasonable tax increase. One more question. The um, general insurance, does that contemplate us having to ensure that junior high school building as a vacant building? That's a great question. Um, and I, I've, I've done a lot of insurance in my time. Most of the reason I was an assistant, so no one wanted to do insurance. So I got tagged with doing it. Um, that would cost us, I believe the number was um, 48,000, 28,000, 28,000, uh, just to cover that. One of the things that we're looking at doing is we have to utilize that building to a certain degree mm -hmm. actively. Mm -hmm. So if we are successful in um, selling off the two daycare facilities. We may temporarily locate those daycare facilities in that building, as well as talk to the folks from Center of Hope and um, you know a couple others to see if we can qualify that and continue to have that as an active building to avoid that 28,000. I think it makes sense to try to do that and if we can get some revenue in to kind of offset some of those operating costs. Uh, and obviously, you know, Job one is to try to get the building sold. We, we've had some informal discussions with one group that um, we think may make some sense. Actually, I, the hospital has been very helpful to us in trying to explore those avenues. Uh, the hospital has also said that they don't think they can take that, take that building on. That's not really in their plans. But they are putting us and trying to work with us to see if there are other medical type facilities, assisted care facilities, as an example, or, or a uh, seniors facility that we can try to use. So we will actively explore those. But you know we're in a we're in a difficult real estate market. So the the reality is, I think that we should come up with some contingency plans to see if we can get somebody in there to avoid some of those costs and offset some of the costs by renting it.
So the answer is no, then, in the in the we budget. Do have the, we do have the 28,000 program. It's in that budget? We do budget? have the 28,000 programmed in the budget. Okay, it is. Good. Okay. And I guess that my, just How'd my. How'd you get a no out of that? I mean, my, I was talking well, <laughs> and talking. No, we, we were conservative with the 28 in. My question, um, you know, related to any increase in transportation under the school department increase versus for us, if you look at the town operating costs um, of $190,000 increase and the rest of that retirement group, group health and life, general insurance debt, those are what I consider fixed costs. Mm -hmm. as I consider transportation for school fixed costs. And then I look at things as discretionary. I look at the school department, the rest of that budget is discretionary. And for us, for all of our departments, that $190,000 as a discretionary. So that's where my, my head is with when I'm looking at this, um, discretionary versus fixed costs. And it's, it's uh, quite amazing, the difference. There's a lot of moving pieces to it. There certainly yeah. are a lot of moving pieces. Yeah. But I, hopefully, like with the health insurance, you know, we've been able to effectuate change. And we've done it in a collaborative manner with the unions. You know, to be honest, other, other towns and other managers would sit there and say, well, cost of doing business. And, and not even try, but we do actively try, and we have had some success. And we will actively try in whatever area where we think we can have success. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Anyone else? Councilor McDonald. Thank you, Madam Chair. Clearly, though, I yeah, can't I'm, hear you at all. My mic's not, now it's working. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you to the town manager. Uh, some of the questions that were raised by my colleagues and answers given mm -hmm. raised another question for me. So I'll start with that one first. When we say we talk about downsizing on the town side through attrition, what positions have we downsized under your tenure on the town side through attrition? Well, again, this has been a cycle. So when I refer to that, from when I started in the budget of 2009, we had two reductions in fire that we kept, and we've now replaced those over time. So when I say downsize, we've done some downsizing. And specifically to that question, it was regards to the unemployment. So by downsizing through attrition, we avoided unemployment costs. In terms of the funding levels that we're at now, or the position levels that we're at now, I believe we're still down one police officer. I think at one point we were down as much as three police officers. Again, done through downsizing. Uh, DPW was two. And we have one that will permanently be gone when we have the uh, the the, um, the school be sold off, the uh, Marcy Street facility sold off. So there are still, we're not operating at the same levels we were in 2008. I think only the fire department is at the same, at the same level that we were at, at in 2008 as it is now today contemplated in this budget. So this budget does retain some of the reductions in staff that we've been able to accomplish over time. Okay. Well, yeah, in response to that, I mean, the Two additional firefighters we put on and the police officers were to fill vacancies that were from the 90s, not any time in this decade. I mean, these were frozen positions that we weren't going to add. Um, my next question then would be relative to the agreement we have with the schools department that they get absorbed 69% and the town absorbs 31%. Mm -hmm. Well, last year they suffered cuts and we suffered none. That agreement does not work in reverse? Well, not, well, number one, that's not correct. In terms of this, I mean, if, if people want to um, to discuss, and I don't believe in the politics of division, but on the town side, on the town operating budgets, it's a 1.7% increase. The school budget, as contemplated in this, is a 2.59% increase. So in both cases, they're increases. What sometimes gets gets displayed as, as I alluded to earlier, the school department has requested a $1.2 million increase. In this budget, we contemplate a $600,000 increase. So if you reduce, and one could argue the point that they've reduced or will need to reduce $600,000 worth of their budget, well, that could be viewed as a reduction. But from my perspective, when you take this year's budget and you put on what we have for resources available, we are allocating a $600,000 increase to them. So there is some question in terms of, you know, there are budgets that were submitted that were um, higher and some that were submitted that were lower that got adjusted. So, you know, that could say that, well, we adjusted it, 
what a proposed budget is versus what actually comes in, I think is really the relevant point to, to where we stand. Okay, and the, um, you stated that the $175,000 decrease in Medicaid, Medicare reimbursements, was any of that relative to ambulance receipts or was that all just on the? Yeah, and, and that's a good question. Um, in terms of the ambulance revenues, as I've indicated earlier at a, at a previous meeting, have held somewhat constant. So we, we don't have necessarily a decrease. We had collections that were two weeks behind. We've remedied that, so now we will see how that works. We've also put into place having those two personnel uh, covering the majority of those shifts that we anticipate having ambulance runs effectuate in. So now that we have that in place, we'll see what that does for ambulance collections. Where we've suffered the reduction is in on the, this is a little bit convoluted, but as special needs children get received their services, some of those services require skilled medical professionals and they require a nurse or you know, a, a speech pathologist, people that have a medical background. The town, and we work very effectively with the school in this, submits for reimbursement, because we're entitled to under Medicare and Medicaid, for those students, not for the, the special needs education portion, but for the special needs medical portion that we can. And in those rates of return that the town has received, the feds have changed the formula, which has resulted in a decrease for us. So if we lay out a million dollars and we used to receive 400,000, now this year we're receiving 275,000 for basically similar type services. And that's a reimbursement formula that the, the feds have in place. But that's related to, to school age kids that receive special education uh, services that are medical in nature. Okay, just a couple more questions. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Um, mm -hmm. Just a couple more questions. In terms of the property and liability insurance rates, are those rates levied on the town predicated upon the claims of all property losses within the community or just the town's claims? We actually, uh, we are with a private carrier, so now we are based upon our experiences, based upon our experience, and they're not mitigated over over pooled, pooled experience. So they are our experience, now certainly we had a claim for a million dollars. They're not gonna collect a million dollars from us for that claim, but our rates are gonna go up and they, and they have been contemplated to go up because of, the, um, because of our claims experience. Okay, so just for clarification then, so we, the town itself suffered a, a million dollars in loss during the tornado? Correct. Uh, the, I, okay, the, in other words, the town, the municipality, not private landowners. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, no, uh, and, we, and where that is, um, Councillor, is up at the airport. Okay. The, uh, the, basically, the three hangars being, one hangar being totally devastated yes. and the other two, that's the majority of that claim. Okay, very good, that was my next question, thank you. And then the last question is, when, we, when we're talking about the uh, potential increase in the capital requirements for the water department, how much of that is uh, related to the increased sales and logistics in supporting the sale of water to Charlton? If any. Well, that's a good question because officially I need to answer it one way for the uh, folks that are in Charlton. A lot of what's being contemplated here are um, watershed improvements, and certainly watershed improvements benefit every user, which includes the town of Charlton. In terms of are there any specific items in this budget that benefit solely the town of Charlton? Absolutely not, because the arrangement we have with them is that they take care of any capital improvement needs for the water system in the town of Charlton. So this is system improvements for us to be able to, to operate more effectively. The watershed is, is the vast majority of it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, anybody else have anything that they wish to discuss regarding the presentation? If not, I'd like to thank the manager and your finance team for putting together a very comprehensive presentation. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to move on. Um, agenda number eight is Citizens Forum. Are there any citizens who wish to come forward this evening?
Any citizens wishing to come forward to discuss anything? Then I'm going to move on. Agenda item number nine. Vote to ratify the new Maya health insurance contract for active employees with an increase of 1.58% for HMO plan, including revised copay, an 8.9% increase for the PPO plan. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Council Langevin? Yes. Council Livingood? Yes. Council Marcucci? Yes. Council McDonald? Yes. Council Nicola? Yes. Council Regis? Yes. Council Spinelli? Yes. Councilor Vandal? Yes. Councilor Clements? Yes. Nine yes. Thank you. Vote, uh, agenda item number 10. Vote to transfer the sum of $25,000 from the Town Council Reserve Fund to DPW accounts as follows. 1-499-5331. Maintenance on trees, $10,000. 1-499-5240. Repair and maintenance of equipment, $15,000. So moved. Second. Any discussion? A roll call, please. Councilor Livingood? Yes. Councilor Marcucci? Yes. Councilor McDonald? Yes. Councilor Nicola? Yes. Councilor Regis? Yes. Councilor Spinelli? Yes. Councilor Vandal? Yes. Councilor Clements? Yes. Councilor Langevin? Yes. Nine yes. Thank you. Agenda item number 11, vote to approve the RFP for 114 Pleasant Street and to authorize the town manager and town attorney to complete any closing documents for a proposal that meets the minimum, minimum acceptable levels of the comparative selection criteria. So moved. Second. Any discussion? A roll call, please. Councilor Marcucci? Yes. Councilor McDonald? Yes. Councilor Nicola? Yes. Councilor Regis? Yes. Councilor Spinelli? Yes. Councilor Vandal? Yes. Councilor Clements? Yes. Councilor Langevin? Yes. Councilor Livingood? Yes. Nine yes? Thank you. Agenda item number 12, vote to ratify the RFP for 115 Marcy Street and to authorize the town manager and town attorney to complete closing documents for a proposal that meets the minimum acceptable levels of the comparative selection criteria. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor McDonald? Yes. Councilor Nicola? Yes. Councilor Regis? Yes. Councilor Spinelli? Yes. Councilor Vandal? Yes. Councilor Clements? Yes. Councilor Langevin? Yes. Councilor Livingood? Yes. Councilor Micucci? Yes. Nine yes? Thank you. Agenda item number... 13, vote to ratify change order number four in the amount of $45,672 revised total as requested by Consigli Construction and recommended by Jocelyn Lesser and Associates for the Middle High School Project. A, vote to accept the revised bid proposal submitted by low bidder HB Communications in response to bid number 2012-06 digital signage technology not to exceed $104,069 for the middle high school. B, vote to accept FF&E bid summary dated March 20th, 2012, submitted by TAPE Associates for the grand total of $1,260,000 for the middle high school. So moved. Second. Any discussion? A roll call, please. Councilor Nicola? Yes. Councilor Regis? Yes. Councilor Spinelli? Yes. Councilor Vandal? Yes. Councilor Clements? Yes. Councilor Langevin? Yes. Councilor Livingood? Yes. Councilor Micucci? Yes. Councilor McDonald? Yes. Nine yes? Thank you. Agenda item number 14. Vote to ratify the memorandum of agreement between the Town of Southbridge and Tri Valley Incorporated for the use of space in the Southbridge Community Center at $100 a month from March 1st, 2012 through February 28th, 2013. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Regis? Yes. Councilor Spinelli? Yes. Councilor Vandal? Yes. Councilor Clements? Yes. Councilor Langevin? Yes. Councilor Livingood? Yes. Councilor Marcucci? Yes. Councilor McDonald? Yes. Councilor Nicola? Yes. Nine yes? Thank you. Okay, before we um, go into agenda item number 15, um, I'd like the members of the Bay Path School uh, to come forward. They're going to go over a, a presentation of what we propose here in agenda items <coughs> number 15 and 15A.
Thank you, and good evening, uh, Madam Chairman and members of the Council. It's been uh, many, many years since I've stood at this podium. It's the same podium from many years ago, but I'm pleased to be here this evening. And uh, obviously, I want to thank the Education and Human Services Subcommittee. We've met twice with them to uh, review the project and some of the language that's on the agenda this evening. And uh, tonight, with your indulgence, although brief, we will go over uh, the project that uh, we've been working on. Uh, the, pro the Bay Path started in 2002 because we knew that we needed to uh, uh, rehab our facilities and that our space was getting tight at uh, Mugged Hill. And we were, using the, uh, we were under the old school building assistance program. Uh, many of you are aware of how that program used to work. Well, in 2004, the program was uh, put on hold because of the financial situation here in the Commonwealth. And when the new MSBA was created in 2007, we submitted a statement of interest to the MSBA. In 2009, then uh, Treasurer Cahill uh, came up with a program whereby 10 regional vocational schools who had SOIs in the pipeline were invited to uh, get into the process. Uh, it was at that time we began looking at the, uh, the work you have in front of you. And just as all communities in the state, we needed to get uh, an OPM on board and then hire an architect and do a feasibility <coughs> study. Uh, this evening, half of our team is in Auburn talking to the Auburn Board of Selectmen, and so you're stuck with myself. And with me is Mark Leiden from Heary International. Mark is our uh, OPM. I'm going to turn it over to him for a brief discussion of the uh, proposed project, and then we can get into finances briefly and, of course, the vote that you'll be looking at this evening. Mark? Good evening, and thank you for giving us this opportunity. Okay, is that a little better? That's a lot better. Okay, good evening, and thank you for once again giving us this opportunity. Many of you have probably already been through the presentation, so I'll try to hit the high points. Um, Bay Path has been in existence, serving the communities of the surrounding area for about 40 years, and doing a pretty good job at, at it. The school, unlike, you know, not unlike many facilities of its vintage, is at the end of its useful life. So, we're faced at a crossroads. The school administration and the school district and the MSBA have put together a team and have challenged us to look at what is it that we can and should do to bring this facility to a condition for it to continue to provide quality vocational education well into the next century. And um, we've put together quite a team. We've looked at a large number of options, including what turned out to be a cost prohibitive new construction um, option. And we've come up with the model you see in front of you. In fact, I need to point out that the model was actually built by the students at Bay Path. And so the existing building, the, the, the part that was just separated to the front by Mr. LaFresh, by Mr. LaFleche, is the, what will become the addition. The existing building is fraught with um, deficiencies. The, um, the new facility will rejuvenate and bring new life to the building, bring in natural light, take the um, media center, which is now tucked in down below the monumental, near, the monumental staircase near the front of the building, and bring that to the upper levels. Um, in addition, the front will comprise what will be the new science and math wing. There are currently only two science labs in the building, neither of which meet anywhere near the um, the current state guidelines for, for the delivery of, of science education. In fact, the need curriculum-wise calls for six science classrooms at a particular point in time. In order to accommodate that, the staff must bring in their, you know, um, their kit, more or less, their science kit on, on a wagon, more or less, to um, to try to do the best they can to deliver the education to the students. Anyways, not getting to belabor the details too much. We're at a crossroads. 
We have a project which has been approved by MSBA at the amount of $73.8 million at their most recent board meeting. Um, that project will provide roughly $46 plus million plus in grant aid from the state of Massachusetts to the, the um, Southern Worcester County Regional School District. The alternative in the event that this project were not to go forward would be that the school district and the uh, member communities would still be faced with significant um, capital improvements that would need to be undertaken to solve some of the deficiencies. And those would probably have an estimated cost in the range of 15 to $25 million, still a significant amount in and of themselves. Um, the key thing to remember about those funds is they would be expended on a, um, a periodic basis, not as part of a comprehensive capital program outlined and administered and, and funded by MSBA. Um, it would take quite a long time to do that, and the net result would not take care of the educational deficiencies, the um, special education needs of the facility, nor the, um, the overcrowding space needs. So, and John, if you can address some of the more financial issues. And before I get into the exact details on the, uh, the project cost, the other thing to understand is when we approached this project, we had hoped and we had started looking at a uh, basically almost a separate little building that we would attach to the main school that would take care of these classrooms we're talking about. Under the Mass Building Code and with MSBA, because of the amount of money even that would have cost, we would have still been under the requirement to bring the current facility up to uh, State Building Code. Right now we have about $2 million of asbestos remediation. We have a roof that is leaking in too many places to count. We have 32 HVAC units that are over 25 years old, three of which, two of the, uh, over the winter and one last week, uh, that uh, died on us and needed major repairs. One won't be repaired until we find out what happens with this project. We have well water at Bay Path. Currently, those wells are all filtered because there's arsenic in the well water and dumps into a 100,000 gallon tank that feeds both the fire hydrants as well as the potable water needs of the, of the building. So therefore, we're filtering uh, way much more water than we need to be filtering. And we're going to be under a order from DEP to separate out the fire water and the uh, potable drinking water. I could go on about the, the many things. So what we're trying to do is refresh this building, add on a state, uh, the, the uh, science and, and math wing, get this done so it's operating for the next 50 years. The project cost overall is 73.8 million, of which 63% would be reimbursed by MSBA, leaving a, a total of 27,300,000 for the 10 towns to, uh, to uh, pay back over the next 30 years. Southbridge's net cost over those 30 years for the debt service principal is $3,743,000. Now tonight there are two votes on your agenda. One is to approve the project itself, the $73 million, allowing us to go ahead and borrow money and also authorizing the expenditure of that money. We can't expend those funds without authorization. The second vote that you'll be taking is to place a two and a half debt exclusion on your ballot in June. The vote to authorize the $73 million, if you've read that vote, which I believe the manager said has been printed in its entirety on the, on the agenda, has a contingency clause in there. In other words, the authorization is contingent upon a successful two and a half ballot. So if the two and a half ballot went down, uh, at that point, we do not have authorization. There is a mechanism, and all 10 towns have to uh, vote in the affirmative on both of those issues, both the authorization vote, which in the other nine towns it will be at town meeting, annual town meeting, and a debt exclusion to be placed on their ballot and voted at their annual town elections. 
if one or more of those towns votes against either of those two measures, either at their town meeting or at their election, then the project doesn't go forward and unless and until uh, we pursued a district-wide ballot. Okay, there is an option to pursue a district-wide ballot, at which time all 10 towns would have a special election, paid for by Bay Path on the same day in each of the communities, and the aggregate vote of that particular uh, uh, election would control whether or not the project goes forward. Uh, certainly, uh, the question has been asked, both here in Southbridge and in other communities, uh, will we go forward with a district-wide ballot if we don't get unanimous consent of all 10 towns on both votes? And the answer is, we would look at what are the district towns saying, certainly by their ballot vote. Uh, I estimate, and it's a rough estimate, that it cost Bay Path about $60,000 to run that type of an election. So obviously it's not in our best interest to throw uh, money away if, if, if we didn't feel there was a, an opportunity that we could um, get authorization. If we don't do this and we go down the path that um, Mark spoke about on the unreimbursed capital projects over time, we will get some of our house in order. Uh, I would suspect, although we haven't had lengthy discussions yet, I would suspect the first thing would be roofs and heating. Stop the leaking, uh, stop some deterioration of that building, okay, because we still need to be there in the future. So we feel that although this is uh, on its face an expensive project in terms of 73.8 million, getting the 63% from the state is, as you know, in your own uh, project. They offer it to you, they give you a time frame in which to act. If you don't take advantage of their funding, they move on because they have a backload of projects that they also are trying to get through. It's not like the old SBAB process where, you know, the community would say yes and then you get put on a shelf for seven years and then come back and, okay, here's your money. So we're under the gun. We have until June 30th to get the approval of the 10 towns at the town meetings, and we have no later than September 1st to get the funding in place through what I think will be nine or 10 debt exclusions. Not all of the towns have definitively said to us that they're going to use a debt exclusion, but preliminary discussions and knowing uh, what the financial situation of most of our communities are, I, I, that, that would be my guess. So let's say that, this, that the council tonight approves these two, ballot, uh, these two uh, questions for us. If uh, a debt exclusion were passed in Southbridge, what, did th what would that mean? Well, for an average home valued at $166,412, the first year of the debt exclusion would take place in fiscal 2014, and that would add $15.17 to a person's tax bill if they owned a home valued at that $166,000. The project, because of its length, will be funded with two local bonds, 30 years each. When that second bond is borrowed sometime in 2015 or 2016, the maximum impact on the tax rate kicks in in tw fiscal 2016, and that would be $46.63 a year at that point for somebody owning a home of $166,000. Obviously, we have to get a lot of information out to the people of Southbridge, as well as to the people of the other nine towns. Tonight, I'm asking for your support, not only of the authorization to do the project, which is the larger, the larger uh, verbiage, but also to put it on your ballot. Give us an opportunity to explain to your citizens uh, what it is we're trying to accomplish and give them the right to vote, uh, I believe, in June here in Southbridge. That's what we would be asking from you this evening, and certainly we're happy to answer any questions at this point on that project. Thank you, Mr. LaFleche. Does anybody at this point have any questions? Go ahead, Councillor Clements. Could you just um, mention to us the number of students you currently have in the building? Yes, thank you. The building was originally built for 850 students back in the 70s at which time there was no special education programs uh, and uh, the academics were certainly a little less rigorous in terms of not needing to pass MCAS and so forth. Today we have 1,100 students in the building. 
Every space uh, of that building is utilized to its fullest. When a new building, including your middle senior high school, was designed, an optimum uh, utilization of the, of the educational spaces is about 85%. Uh, in other words, if you're 85% using each room during each period, that's a, that's a very efficient building. Right now, Bay Path is at 93%. The other percentage is hallways and those kinds of things. And we may have one or two classrooms for half of a day that aren't being used. Several years ago, we had a program with the Southern Worcester County Educational Collaborative that we were happy to house. We had to ask them to leave at the end of their lease because we now have a science class in that particular area. Uh, we have, if you came into our shops, when the facility was originally built, all of those, uh, those four large, I call them wings, uh, at the bottom are primarily shop space. Those shops were wide open. In the intervening years, our own kids, primarily masonry with block masons, uh, put up walls and we've made classrooms in each of those shops. So although we're putting a 50, asking for a 50,000 square foot addition for, for academic space in the front of the building, that will allow us to remove those classrooms that take up floor space in the shops, that's how we get more space in the shops. In terms of Southbridge, uh, we've talked about formulas and, and part of it will also is in our budget. But right now, the town of Southbridge represents 13.1% of the K through 12 population of the 10 towns, regardless of where those students are going, whether they're school choice, they're Bay Path, they're private, or they're going to Southbridge Public Schools. Southbridge represents 13.1% of the K through 12 population. Southbridge residents make up, up almost 25% of the 1,100 kids in the building. As the manager presented his budget, you saw our budget was down 165,000 uh, this year. Uh, he talked about reversing the trend of school choice students and as I looked at the budget, he had a modest uh, increase from the new base at Bay Path. Uh, at this point in time, uh, it appears that there may be a, a, a decrease of about 20 kids next year. Seven of our 10 towns in the fiscal 13 have utilized all of their seats, including Southbridge. Three of the smaller towns have not, which leaves us maybe 20 or 30 uh, seats to allocate to those other seven towns who are waiting mm -hmm. for more space. So you may pick up a few of those, but we're graduating, and, and the allocation this year is 41. That was the seat allocation. But we're coming off some very high years uh, mm -hmm. of students. So we're graduating 64 Southbridge students this year, replacing them with somewhere between 40 and maybe as high as 50, but mm -hmm. in that range. So you will see another little uh, decrease next year. Uh, certainly, we would take as many students as we could. Now, this project does not uh, increase our enrollment. It gives us the space to do what we need to do with our enrollment. Okay, in other words, those, those uh, science and math labs and that kind of thing. Over time, there may be an incremental increase from the 1100, but that, that number is set by this MSBA uh, formula. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> that was a long explanation. I'm sorry. How many students we have? No, but you were very thorough, and and you have been very thorough in the two meetings that we've had, um, also in the presentation you did up at the high school that I attended, um, and and I just want to make sure that people understand that tonight's votes don't necessarily put this project on the on the fast track to to it's it's a done deal because really it would have to come to the people because in the mechanism that that is here to That's have right. to do the override, it would end up going on to the ballot as you have said. So ultimately it, it does become a decision of the communities um, and even if we do have to go to the, to the full vote of the majority of the, of the people, again it goes back to the taxpayers, the voters here. So what we do is procedural here this evening on, on a, what appears to be a, a very worthwhile project and something that is, is one way or the other, we have to do something about the building. It's part of our responsibility, but yet, ultimately, it does go back to the people 
um, that are watching and in the other communities. So I just want that to be clear to the people that it's we're not voting tonight to to say, hey, go for it and do what right. you need to do. We're just really putting in place the steps that will bring us to the next level of letting the people in all the communities that participate decide um, what's going to happen. So uh, thank you for your presentations and your clarity on, on many things that you have done um, over the last few uh, months, weeks with us. Thank you. Any, did you have a question there? Or was that no, that was oh, a okay. statement to make sure people understood what we've been doing okay. here, and, you know, because yep. it's, it's going to be mm -hmm. difficult. Of course it is. But again, um, Bay Path is part of the okay. Southbridge School experience. There are an awful lot of people that um, live in this community, have lived in this community, who have taken advantage of Bay Path and have put food on the table and lived very long, useful, good, productive lives. It is not Southbridge High School, oh yeah, and then there's Bay Path. It's Southbridge High School and Bay Path. And it's a choice that many people have made and benefited by it. So this is, um, these two votes, as Councillor Clements alluded to, are not to have the project go forward, it is to have the project go on the ballot and the community will decide whether it goes forward, at least from our, our perspective. So I want to make that clear too, in case it wasn't. Just if, um, if, um, if I could. Town manager wishes to speak as well, thank you. Just to, to that point, um, the council is the appropriating authority. Mm -hmm. And in this case, the council is authorizing the appropriation of the $73 million that approval tonight is then contingent upon the voters agreeing for an override, a debt exclusion override specifically for this project. If the council votes favorably tonight on this, and if the uh, community votes favorably for the override, the debt exclusion override, then this is effective by law mm -hmm. and that there would be no return request of the council. This would be kind of one stop and approval. So I just want to make sure that it, it, it is kind of clear that the, the council is approving this project mm -hmm. on its merits, but the funding of it is being subject to a debt exclusion override and contingent upon the debt exclusion override. But from MSBA purposes, and we did the same when we had our project, is that we didn't need to do the debt exclusion, but it's kind of a one-stop shopping where once this is approved, this project would go forward. Well, Mr. Manager, one shop, one-stop shopping in 10 shops, though. But exactly. in 10 shops for you, one here. Uh, and if I might, Madam Chairman, just one last point. Uh, we would sincerely like to invite, obviously, the council, but all of the residents of, of Southbridge who are interested, May 2nd, um, 2012 at 6.30 p.m. at our cafeteria. We are going to have an overview of the project. There will be tours of the facility available, and at least for a guy like me, most importantly, refreshments available, uh, made by the kids at the culinary arts. So to the extent that you're watching at home, I'd like to invite you all up to Bay Path. Uh, I'll be at the Oxford Town Meeting that night, so I won't be able to greet you personally, but we have some very good people who will be there who would like to show you what we're talking about. I hope they save you some refreshments. <laughs> I get my fair share. Thank you. <laughs> Councilor Marcucci. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you. Mr. LaFleche, part of this project, is the school compliant with handicap accessibility? Is this something that's also going to be part of this project, if that's an issue for the school? Yes, and thank you for mentioning that. In, in an effort to be as brief as, as possible with you folks, some of the exact details we've left out, but one of the cost drivers, 67% of the funds will be spent on the current building, bringing that up to code uh, and changing some of the configuration of the spaces. But all of the ramps, each one of those um, five wings, is connected to the main building through a ramp system. Those ramps are out of compliance with ADA. The doors, uh, are out, all of our doors to classrooms are out of compliance with ADA, especially in some of the shops. They have a, it's hard for me to explain not being a building person, but the door is not flush with the wall. There's a little entryway before you get to that door. So that does not comply. A person with a wheelchair, for example, cannot get into there and then open the door, you know. Uh, so there's a lot of that. 
there are also issues with the elevator, those kinds of things. So everything that is out of compliance from ADA will be brought into compliance. Now, we mentioned that the uh, uh, net reimbursement is about 63%. Actually, the grant is for 67% of eligible costs. <coughs> we have worked very hard not to add ineligible costs. Now, what are ineligible costs? Uh, any outside work over 8% of the uh, project cost is, is ineligible. So we didn't go over that. We haven't added a lot of fancy parking and those kinds of things. Our bleachers have been condemned by the town of Charlton if this project goes forward. What that means is we will tear those down. They currently seat 1,200. We're going to rebuild a 600-seat uh, bleacher. Under ADA, we would have had to build another uh, 12 standalone uh, uh, toilets out near the field. We went to Boston. We got a, a um, uh, variance from the Mass Architectural Access Board because the building is within 300 feet of those bleachers. So we'll be adding a few stalls to the back uh, of our building that already has bathrooms. We're going to lose some of our foyer. But what we're not doing, other than handicap accessibility to the bleachers inside that gymnasium, we're not, we're not adding to that gymnasium. And other than uh, retrofitting for handicap purposes, our lecture hall, which holds about 140 people, which right now we, we use that mainly for teachers and maybe a couple of classes, um, we, we won't have an auditorium. Because both of those would have added to this cost without any reimbursement. But you're absolutely right. Uh, all of those uh, building types of things come under codes of one sort or another, mm -hmm. handicap being the most important, obviously. Uh, we do have 22% of our students on special education services of one sort or another, and we do have a, a, a small elevator that we use quite a bit. We also, uh, as you know, probably have a lot of the public coming up to the building. So for example, some of the services that the public uses, like the cosmetology shop, and uh, the, uh, the store and the restaurant, those are going to be in that new area uh, and much easier accessibility. And it also allows us to serve the public while still keeping the main school locked off at all times, whereas now we've got the buzzer system, which will continue, but a lot of people are coming in to get hair done, going to the restaurant, all that will be gone. There'll be no interaction except for the kids that are working in that particular shop. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Anyone else? Council Langevin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you gentlemen for coming tonight. Uh, well, this is a tough one, really, for the whole town of Southbridge, but as I said in subcommittee, um, I am a, a big believer of Bay Path. Um, I think they're doing great things up there, and uh, I don't, when it comes time for the vote, I hope the citizens of this community does support it, and, and I understand the financial constraints it's going to put on everyone. Um, I did receive one phone call tonight. Um, I just got it in the middle, so I didn't get to talk to the person, but the person said, I hope you vote no on this tonight. Um, you know, when I sit up here, I try to weigh all the facts and stuff, and the bottom line is we, we the town of Southbridge, as Madam Chair spoke about, said we've been using this school um, for about 40 years. And now Bay Path is coming forward saying we need your help and your support to better our school for the public. You know, and as Mr. LaFleche said, right now currently we have 25% of the students and I believe out of the 10 districts we're the highest uh, volume of students in the district. Yeah for many years? Yes, even with the, uh, the recent decrease, we, had, we were as high as about 290 Southbridge students three years ago. Even at the roughly 250, I don't have the exact number, uh, you're at least 70% higher than the next closest community. And with, with that being said, um, I, you know, and, and I don't want to take People take this the wrong way. People chose to go to Southridge High and they go on to college and some people go to Bay Path and chose to get a trade, not saying that they don't go on to college because they do go on to college by the choice. But at least we're giving 
our residents of this community a choice to get a trade and be, go out in the world and be very successful. Uh, and I've known people that have businesses now um, just by going to Bay Path and, and getting this trade. So I am a very strong believer of this. I am going to be supporting in this tonight and saying yes. And I hope when it comes time, and it's going to be extremely painful and a big thought for the community and just like any other town to move this forward. Um, but I am just a true believer. And if, you know, we sit here and say it's not a good time, there'll never, ever, ever going to be a good time. Um, so I just want to let you know, I want to thank you for you coming forward tonight and uh, in subcommittee speaking on behalf of this project. And I, I will be in full support of this tonight. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilor Landrin. And one last point is that we need to remember that the uniqueness of our facility extends even into evenings. Okay, our facility is used. We have over 1,400 evening, uh, adult evening students every, uh, every semester. And we are fortunate to be able to provide continuing education for plumbers, electricians, and other tradespeople who need to keep their licenses up. So a lot of our tradesmen, whether they went to Bay Path as high school students or not, are returning to Bay Path to keep their licenses in those trades. And we're fortunate in having a facility to be able to do that. And so we get a, a tremendous amount of use at Bay Path. Thank you. Councillor Spinelli. I'm probably going to come across as being very negative, and I, I, I apologize because I'm not trying to be negative at all. The original structure that was built 40 years ago, John, what's the square footage of the original structure? 200, approximately 200,000 square feet. And the new structure is going to be approximately 50,000? Right. Okay. The old structure, we're going to rehab it, bring it up to code, but it's still a 40-year-old structure. What would be the anticipated life of this structure, bringing it up to code? Because obviously the maintenance on the old part is, is going to increase over time. It has to. Okay. Let me, Mark, I mean, you, is there a projection that yeah. says, okay, the, the old structure still has 20 years, 25 years? Yeah. The, the old structure, in fact, MSP, MSBA requires that the project that we do last 50 years. Now, there will be elements within the new renovated system that will need to be repaired or replaced or maintained. However, the life, the design life of the new facility, including the addition, will be 50 years, and that's stipulated in writing in the documents that get executed with the MSBA. And on a related note, Mr. Spinelli, uh, that 67.1% reimbursement rate comes through a number of different factors. For example, is it two points we're getting for the chips? Two, two, two. Yeah, we get two extra points of reimbursement because the building will be designed in an energy efficient manner. Uh, we're getting 1.3 additional points for maintenance. And what that means is you can get a total of two points. In order to get the two full points, you have to agree in writing to set aside over a million dollars in a fund for future maintenance. Well, we couldn't do that. We don't have those funds. However, the standard statewide has been to get one point. We're getting 1.3 points because the state has come in and looked at what we have done in maintenance on this building over the years. Uh, if you came to the facility, you would not say, oh my God, this, this place is 40 years old, look at how bad. No, because we've, we have maintained it. The problem is the HVAC units, for example, we maintain them until they're on their last leg and then they're very expensive to replace. One of the big costs we didn't talk about is the fact that the facade, all around this whole facility, there's uh, an aluminum, uh, fascia. thank you, fascia, that is allowing water in between the brick and the block 
thereby rusting all the ties that are holding the, block, the brick to the block. So in a significant area, we're going to have to take the brick off, replace all that. So that's why some of the cost is so high. Now, as Mark Leiden has said, the new plan addresses this, gets rid of this, so in the future we're not having those same problems. Part of the, may I continue, Matt? The, um, you said 67% of the 73 plus million dollars is for renovation, okay? Which comes to 48, almost 49 million dollars, okay? The renovation then is not just for the new roof and for the ADA compliancy, but the renovation will also remedy a lot of the problems that exist now and potentially could worsen in the future. Because you're talking about, you know, you're talking almost two thirds of this $73 million going into renovation and only one third of it actually going into the new 50,000 square foot facility, plus, you know, ancillary things that you're doing. So from my point of view, the, the new addition is a bargain compared to the overall budget, because obviously what you're stating is that renovation is exorbitant compared to building brand new. Well, it's not exorbitant, but it certainly is a greater, it's a greater cost because it's more labor intense, it's, it's, it's more redoing, refixing, and everything else. There's more thought process that goes into it. So it is, so, and I'm not trying to be negative. I'm trying to let people know because I came in here tonight with the idea that I was gonna vote against this. And I have three children that are school teachers, and I'm very, and I am a certified school teacher, and I'm very much pro-education. But I was concerned about the fact that this is a huge amount of money to be asking the citizens of Southbridge to for, fork up in addition to what they've already generously done with our own town and our own new middle and junior high school. What I do like about this, and the reason why I will not vote no, is because ultimately the voters of the town of Southbridge will have the opportunity to express their opinion, to either go up or down. So my vote, yay or nay, although yay is a better vote, it's still ultimately not the final decision. It does give you the authorization to say, okay, if you win over the voters, you've got the green light and you can go ahead. Absolutely right. And, we and appreciate, we appreciate ultimately this is, to me, what is democracy and, and what should happen. What we did with our changes to the charter were the same thing. Ultimately, it goes back to the voters. And so, to me, um, I read this, but I didn't read it. And people were calling me and telling me to vote no. And, and they all had very good reasons. And I was listening to them, and I was being persuaded by them. And uh, I, I still am concerned about the cost, but I think that the correct thing for me to do as a counselor is to vote yes on 15, to vote yes on 15A, and ultimately to let the citizens of Southbridge determine the worth or the not non-worth of this project. Because ultimately, they're the ones who foot the bill. It's not what I say, it's what they say in the end. And, and so, you know, this is certainly needed I can't quibble with you at all. Um, certainly deserved. It's just a very hard thing to do. But if I tell people by my vote and express my opinion, if you may think it's negative, it's truly not. It's just that there is. Um, a, this is a very serious thing to support. 
and um, you know it's worthwhile. Don't get me wrong, but it's a tough thing to do economically. And uh, I hope I hope that you are successful because I really do believe in education. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor McDonald. Thank you, Madam And then Chair. after Councillor McDonald, I'm going to read these votes so we can move ahead on them. Yeah. Go ahead, Councillor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, after listening to the, looking over the material and listening to the presentation that was given the other night by Mr. Papini and uh, Mr. LaFleche, which they did a good job on, I've been an advocate for holding the line on certain things in taxes because of things like this. There are things that are like nice to haves and there are things that are necessity. And to me, this is a necessity. And when you look at the options that we have present, presented before us, this one makes the most business sense. And I say that because it's the cheapest option for the taxpayers in the long run. It is going to be done, as has been pointed out already, by a vote of the people to do a two and a half debt exclusion and not an override. And that's another good thing because it doesn't mean it's a permanent increase. It means it goes away when it's lived its usefulness in, in funding the project. Um, this school has brought a significant amount of uh, benefit to the community in the form of skilled labor that has done things for free for town projects across all of the member towns. Uh, there are a number of small businesses, owner-operator businesses, that are directly a result of graduates of Bay Path. And you can think of many, HVAC and, and other type of industries out there, small engine repair. Um, I like the analogy or the illustration that Mr. Flesh used the other night in the subcommittee that when you get a call for somebody to fix your HVAC system or your furnace or whatever, you're not going to be outsourced to another country in doing so. You're going to get homegrown people who have the skill set here. The other thing is businesses look to locate into communities that have a feeder system for this. And, and that's exactly what our educational system is designed to do, and that's exactly what this is designed to do. We've already, we know about the adult education benefit as well as the student. So, um, and, and the final thing is it's going to the people, and it's going to be the people say. So I'll be voting yes on both of them tonight for those reasons. Uh, we're looking at a reimbursement rate. Uh, we made a mistake a number of years ago with uh, the pod system, and I don't think we should make that mistake now. We are going to get a better deal and a better price for what we have to pay for anyway in this particular mode, so I'm going to vote for it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? I don't want to cut anybody off, but uh, I think we should move along if nobody has anything further to add. Councilor Regis, just, just quickly, please. Quickly, regarding the, the vote, if I could, Madam sure. Chair. Um, and this, is, this might not be a big deal, but just in my experience with Bond Council and the MSBA, um, we're missing um, a word here. Um, uh, renovation of the, on the fourth line down, the Bay Path Regional Vocational Technical High School. Regional, okay. And then after the 67.41% of eligible approved project costs as determined by. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, very good, good catch, thank you. Okay, I'm with, with, if there's nothing further, I'm going for the vote. And I'm going to have to read this all out in its entirety. So please bear with me. Vote that the town hereby approves the $73,722,405 borrowing authorized by the Southern Worcester County Regional Vocational School District, in, in parentheses, the district, for the purpose of paying costs of designing, constructing, originally equipping, and furnishing an addition to and renovation of the Bay Path Regional Vocational Technical High School located at 57 Old Mugget Hill Road, Charlton, Mass., including the payment of all costs incidental or related thereto, the, thereto the project, which school facility shall have an anticipated useful life as an educational facility for the instruction of school children of at least 50 years, for which the district may be eligible for a school construction grant from the Massachusetts School Building Authority, known as the MSBA, set amount to be expended at the direction of the School Building Committee, that the town acknowledges that the MSBA's grant program is a non-entitlement discretionary program based on need as determined by the MSBA and any project costs the district incurs in excess of any grant approved by and received from the MSBA shall be the sole responsibility of the district 
and its member municipalities, provided further that any grant that the district may receive from the MSBA for the project shall not exceed the lesser of 167 and 41 hundredths percent of eligible approved project cost, costs as determined by the MSBA or two, the total maximum grant amount determined by the MSBA provided, however, that the approval of the district's borrowing by this vote shall be, the su shall be subject to and contingent upon an affirmative vote of the town <coughs> to exempt its allocable share of the amounts required for the payment of interest and principal on said borrowing, borrowing for the limitations on taxes imposed by Mass General Law 59, Section 21C, Proposition 2 and a half and that the amount of borrowing authorized by the district shall be reduced by any grant amount set forth in the project funding agreement that may be executed between the district and the MSBA. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Can I have a roll call, please? Councilor Spinelli? Yes. Councilor Vandal? Yes. Councilor Clements? Yes. Councilor Langevin? Yes. Councilor Livingood? Yes. Councilor Marcucci? Yes. Councilor McDonald? Yes. Councilor Nicola? Yes. Councilor Regis? Yes. Nine yes? Thank you. Okay, 15A. Vote that in accordance with Chapter 59, Section 21C of the General Laws, the Town Council votes to seek voter approval of the following question at the town election to be held on June 26, 2012. Shall the town of Southbridge be allowed to exempt from the provisions of Proposition 2 and a half, so called, the amounts required to pay the town's allocable share of the bond issued by the Southern Worcester County Regional Vocational School District for the purpose of paying costs of designing, constructing, originally equipping, and furnishing in addition to and renovation of the Bay Path Regional Vocation, no, <laughs> Technical High School, located at 57 Old Mugget Hill Road, Charlton, Mass., including the payment of all costs incidental or related hitherto. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Can I have a roll call, please? Councilor Vandal? Yes. Councilor Clements? Yes. Councilor Langevin? Yes. Councilor Livingood? Yes. Councilor Marcucci? Yes. Councilor McDonald? Yes. Councilor Nicola? Yes. Councilor Regis? Yes. Councilor Spinelli. Yes. Nine yes. And there you have it. Good luck to you. Thank you for your votes this evening. You're very welcome. Good night. Absolutely. Oh, you know, that's not for us. Thank you again. And thank you for your patience. LaFleche, could you make sure that these flyers, Mr. LaFleche? John, John, do you have any of these fly these extra? These flyers that we know are, are around the town hall, perhaps we could also have them at the library? Or, yeah, you know, we can distribute some. That way yeah, there are people who are interested. They've, they've got together a very informative flyer with all the stats and details of this project, or just about all of them. So certainly um, the community might want to inform Absolutely. themselves by reading some of that material. Beautiful. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. That's okay. We got, oh, yeah. That's okay. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you, you too. Agenda item number 16 is Councilor's Forum. We're going to start with Councilor Langevin. I'm all set this evening. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Spinelli. I'm all set, Madam Chair. Thank you. Councilor Livingood. I think I'm all set. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Councillor McDonald. I'm all set this evening. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Councillor Vandal. Um, I got a call from a person the other day saying that he was following the Casella truck going up Gulfwood Road. He said the, the operator was just emptying the garbage in the, in the truck, taking the containers and throwing them on the ground, not putting the covers back on, throw the covers one area, put the barrel in another area, so he was following him for a few stops, and then when he, he passed the truck, he got up in the front of the truck and he asked the driver, 
do you think you could put the barrels, you know, the right way and put the covers on like, you know, the town asked of you? And he just smiled at the guy. So, I mean, we hear this time and time again. When are they going to adhere to, to the law? That's all I have. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Marcucci? I'm all set this evening. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Councillor Regis? All set. Thank all you. set. Councillor Clements? Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to remind people you mentioned that the yard waste dumpsters were now in place and, and usable. And having used those myself, I'm, I am asking that uh, we're all mindful when we use those dumpsters and we bring our refuse all the way in. Um, sometimes people seem to want to leave their piles at the front, and those are very long dumpsters, and it makes it difficult to fill from the back then for those who might be bringing. Um, brush and things that they need to, uh, to dump there. So if you could just be mindful in using that, that free uh, resource that we have here in this community, I would appreciate it. And something I've, I've seen in the paper a number of times, and I just want to make sure for those seniors who are still up and watching, um, just to remind you that tax help is available um, during this tax season. It's been in the paper, but just in case you don't get that and you, you aren't aware of it, um, the Southbridge Council on Aging Department uh, again, has tax help sponsored by the AARP Tax Aid Consultants for Seniors 60 years and older um, on several dates. And if you want more information of this, you should contact uh, Mike Trombley, the Executive Director of the Southbridge Council on Aging. He's over at the Community Center, and that phone number is 508 764 5436. It may have be on the scroll as far as I know also, but I'm just reminding people that as tax season ends, uh, the seniors, we do have some help out there for you. So that's all. Wonderful. Thank you, Councillor. Um, agenda item number 17 is the uh, discussion of the next meeting. Uh, we will be meeting here Monday, April 9th, 2012, 7 p.m., right here in Council Chambers. Okay. And finally, adjournment. All in favor? Thank you. Meeting is over.